Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining me today in our continuing study through the King James Holy Bible in one year. Today is Wednesday, May 1st, year of our Lord, 2024. Okay, so in our continuing study, we are now at the book of Exodus, and I want to touch on something I failed to touch on in my last video. And also apologize for my inconsistent uh, schedule here because uh, I've gone too many days before posting. And uh, I, I, I sincerely apologize for my inconsistency. I need to be more consistent in these studies and probably should put out a video every other day to stay on track, at least at a minimum. Okay, so I might even do more. Uh, I think I wouldn't wouldn't hurt me to do uh, one per day uh, minimum. Okay, so I'm gonna try that. Thank you to all who took time to pray for me. By the way, uh, when I had the difficulties and and discontinued the study temporarily, shut the study down. Uh, I'm thankful. I believe your prayers were answered. Um, we got the technical issues solved and we're back online, so praise the Lord. Um, if you're with me, you know, we, we both survived and we've made it to the merry month of May. So let me touch on very briefly uh, something I failed to address in my first Exodus video uh, that occurs in this translation in chapter 4 that is somewhat controversial um, I do not believe it's an outright mistake. I believe, well, it is a mistake, but it's not a textual error as far as I can see. I, I'm going to give my opinion on it, and I'm not going to be dogmatic and say this is absolute truth. I'm just going to give my considered opinion. I spent a few hours researching it, and my uh, total expert on uh, original manuscripts of the Bible, no, I am not. And I've said that repeatedly you know. Uh, but let me uh, give you my considered opinion on what it is. And I believe it's simply an omission of text. Okay, some people say it's it's worse than that. It's a flat-out error. I have trouble believing that due to the fact that the research I've seen on the King James translators were that they were very responsible people and very capable translators. And it's hard to believe they would... Um, make a um, complete uh, textural um, gross error. I do now. There could be many reasons why a portion of text is omitted. Uh, one thing we have to keep in mind. I've said this before: is that the original texts are thousands of years old and might have been a portion of, of text that had suffered some degradation. Uh, there could be many reasons. I, we can speculate. I don't think anyone knows of 100% certainty, although many, some do claim they, that it's just uh, outright error and bad, uh, bad scholarship on the part of the King James translators. I don't believe that. So, but let's address it real quick. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I want to get back to our study of Exodus here. So, in the fourth chapter, we're going back half a step now because we're going to go from this back up to chapter 7 and go from there. Here we are in chapter 4, though. And there's there appears to be a dis discrepancy here in the text. Now, let's have some background so we can look at this thing in context. The man Moses was born of the Hebrew uh, people um, at a time when there was a standing order from the Pharaoh to kill all male children that were born to the Hebrews. He was uh, put in a small basket by the riverside amongst the vegetation of the river to keep him hidden from the Egyptians. However, 
uh, one on a day when the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, she discovered the basket with the child in it. Uh, long story short, uh, ended up being given to a Hebrew girl who happened to know the mother. I think it was a relative of of Moses, who who said who saw the who witnessed uh, Moses being found and said, "Hey, you want me to uh, get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you?" And Pharaoh's daughter said, "Sure," and so. Um, the child, the girl went and got the uh, Moses' mother, real mother, and gave Moses to his real mother to nurse. And so he was nursed and weaned by his real biological mother. Um, this whole thing was orchestrated by God. So instead of being killed, as the order was, uh, Pharaoh's daughter had pity on it, the child and decided to let it be uh, nursed, and then decide to raise him as her own son. After that, okay, so instead of following the order that Pharaoh had given, and the midwives were trying to save the children alive too, and it says they refused to do Pharaoh's commandment of killing the male children, and they made up some excuse as to why they couldn't do it when Pharaoh said, why aren't you killing the children like I told you to? They said, well, the Hebrew women are lively and it's hard. They're not like the Egyptian women. And uh, and uh, by the time we get the child, uh, you know, uh, the, the women have uh, already given birth and, the, and already taken the child away, okay, um, or something. They said some kind of, made up some kind of story. But anyway, they refused to follow man's commandment and they feared God because they feared the Lord. And it says because they did that, God ended up blessing them. Okay? And so that's a good lesson for all of us to always fear God and to do His will when it comes down to a choice between obeying the laws and wishes of men versus uh, the commandment of God, of course, we got to go with God's way every time. So that's what they did, and they were blessed because they did that. Now, Moses grew up. There was a disagreement one day between a fellow Israeli and an Egyptian. The Egyptian was, um, was harassing uh, the Israeli. Moses saw it and kind of got involved and started defending the Israeli, uh, his uh, Israeli brother, um, and ended up killing the Egyptian. And it was found out um, the next day it was brought to light that this was found out, and Moses decided he better flee the country. So he ended up going to a nearby country named of Midian, where he met a, a priest, in the, in the religion of Midian, named of Jethro, who had a family there and was a very devout man, but did not really know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, Later on, Moses was, was able to introduce Jethro to the true God, but he was a seeker of truth and he was a good man. That much is evident. We'll find that out later on in the text. But here we are. For now, we're talking about what happened here in, in chapter 4. Um, Moses and, and Jethro became friends. Jethro ended up giving Moses a job of keeping his sheep and ended up giving Moses his daughter named Zipporah to Moses as a wife. Okay. But, now remember, Zipporah was raised as a daughter of a priest of Midian. They weren't worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know if they were just worshiping, you know, it was kind of like a, a Greek and Roman situation where they were saying uh, to the unknown God, you know, but they were sincere and... Uh, they they were taught, Moses was able to uh, teach Jethro later on who the true living God was. Zipporah 
for her part, didn't really understand what was going on. And when the commandment was given for circumcision, which was a sign God was continuing from the days of Abraham, she didn't, my, and understandably so, she had objections to it. And she was probably thinking, why do we have to do this to our son? You know, and uh, so it probably seemed like a strange custom to her. And in chapter four, we read, the Lord said unto Moses, verse 21, when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all these, all those wonders before Pharaoh. So God's getting ready to do signs and wonders like never before. Okay, and he's and Moses is going to be the initiator of it. Him and his older brother Aaron, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now, that's the most important. It, it sounds like we're building up to something, and indeed we are. Uh, it, would, it was the slaying of all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, which was the Passover. And the Israelis were instructed to put a blood of a lamb on their doorpost, on the head of their door, and on the two side posts of their doors, forming a cross, by the way. A couple thousand years before Jesus even came on the scene, as a sign, and God said, when the death angel comes, which I'm going to send throughout all the land of Egypt, if they see the blood on your doorpost, if, if you follow my instructions, your firstborn will be spared, but the firstborn of the Egyptians shall not be. And all the first, and it ended up that all the firstborn of the Egyptians died, including the animals they had. So all the firstborn of the cattle died as well. So verse 22 says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go that he may serve me. And thou, and if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So he's showing them who the real God is. He's saying, you know, I, I am the God who, of life and death. I'm the God who created you. Not, not uh, Ra, the sun God, or 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 um, Horus, the time god, or what the other Egyptian gods, or the Pharaoh who is deemed to be a god at a certain point. I think he says those aren't true gods. He goes, I'm I, Jehovah, am the true god. Now the next, here's where the problem comes. Instead of continuing with that narrative, all of a sudden there's there's a change of subject, an abrupt change here in verse 24. The next verse says, And it came to pass by the way in the inn that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now the question's asked. Everybody says, well, Wait a minute. First he's talking about the message he's going to get to Pharaoh about kill, slaying his firstborn. And now we're talking about the Lord's going to kill somebody. Well, who's he? Is he going to kill Moses? Well, I believe it's not Moses he was going to kill, but Moses' son who was uncircumcised because Moses had yet to perform the task that God had given him, which was to circumcise both of his sons. And then verse 5, or excuse me, verse 25, kind of sheds some light on it. It says, Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet. So he was told to do this a few days earlier and and hadn't done it. And so the Lord said, you know, whoever is not circumcised among my people is going to be cut off. So it said the Lord 
So I don't think he, the Lord was going to kill Moses. He was actually, ta uh, you know, going to kill his son. And then Zipporah said, okay, I'll do it. And she took the foreskin and she cast it at the feet of Moses and said, surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So she's thinking, oh, this is a bloody ritual. This is, this is weird. I don't get it. And so she, she, she had a real violent disagreement here with Moses. And uh, I think that's what it was. Now, why the sudden abrupt change from verse 23 to 24? Um, and I, this is my opinion and, and my opinion only. You don't have to go along with it. But I think do the little bit of research and I don't claim to be a, a, an authority on ancient biblical text. Others who are more studied say it was a blatant error on the part of the King James translators. I don't necessarily go along with that because they were very able translators and very responsible men. And, and uh, I think what might have occurred was, now remember this text is very old, even back then. And the, the text itself might have suffered some damage. Um, it might have deteriorated. There might have been several reasons, but I believe it was simply a matter of some of the text being left out, an omission. Okay, now, it, rather than an error in translation, it was an omission. They just left some of the text out. So it doesn't have a continuity. You're going from the Lord talking about how he's going to slay the firstborn of Egypt, and then all of a sudden... It came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him. Who's, first of all, who's him? Is it Moses or is his son? I think it probably talking about his son who was at this point still uncircumcised. And contrary to what God had instructed Moses up to this point, that you're going to circumcise your sons just like I had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob circumcise themselves and their sons and their families. And I think his wife, being from the religion that was the country, her father being a priest of Midian, she didn't understand this custom that Moses was asking of her and finally relented and did it and uh, threw down the foreskin in disgust and anger and said, uh, you know, a bloody husband are you to me? You know, this is a weird bloody custom you're asking me to do. So she, so he let him go. And she said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. So she had objections to it. And so finally they all got on the same page. And the mission continues in verse 27. And the Lord said to Aaron, Aaron was M Moses elder brother who was sent along with Moses to help Moses because Moses had difficulty speaking. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness and meet Moses. And he went and met him in the Mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. That's verse 28. Verse 29 and Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, that they were still slaves under oppression, okay, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. Okay, now we're going to jump ahead in our next study to chapter 7 where the Lord begins or commences to do a series of signs and wonders before Pharaoh to show Pharaoh and the Egyptians and not just them but I believe the whole world that he was the living God the true God the one and only creator God not all these other religions that the world was engaging in in a blind attempt to find God, which we all have. We all want to know, how did we get here? What's our purpose? Why are we here? Who put us here? 
did we evolve from microbes, whatever, you know, the basic questions of life. And so God's showing, I'm the creator. I'm the reason you're here. And I'm the one and only God, not these other gods you've made up or these other philosophies you've made to explain your existence. But I and I alone, the Jehovah God, the creator of heaven and earth, is our he told Moses, just tell them that I am sent you. Okay. I am that I am. Okay. And that's all, probably all, as far as we can really understand of God, because God, as I've said many times before, and will say many times, God is infinite, and, and we cannot comprehend God with our puny human intellect. We can understand so much as he's given us the ability to understand, we certainly can't even begin to comprehend the length, width, height, and depth of Almighty God with our minds alone. That's why we come to Christ with our hearts first and foremost, and our minds are part of, are included in that. Okay, so I'm going to continue this study in a, next time. Uh, thanks for joining me today. God bless you all. Uh, have a happy 1st of May. And uh, my birthday is in a, just a little over a week from now on the 9th. So uh, hopefully I'll get a couple studies in before then. But we'll see you th on the next one.